I'm going to talk about space, something I really get excited about. Um, I work for a company that's 100 years old. Uh, we're known as a, as a company that makes furniture for offices. But, but when people ask me, well, what do you really do? What's your core competence? Um, I always say, you know, we think about space. Uh, we think about behavior. Uh, and we think about um, the behaviors that go on in those spaces. And we try to figure out how to design spaces intentionally for the behaviors and the activities and the interactions that you want to happen as opposed to the ones that you don't want to happen. So, so I thought I'd start with a comment that we really believe that space impacts behavior and we can really create wonderful experiences if, if we really dig into that. So, you know, probably most of you have been in a movie theater before and I was just curious, when you walk into a movie theater, you know, once your eyes kind of acclimate and you notice that there are a few people sitting here and there, where do you sit? You know, do you, do, you, do you go up and you sit right next to the family in the second row that you've never met before? You don't know them? No, you don't. You probably don't. And, you know, there's, there's a reason for that. And it's because when, when we talk to environmental behavior theorists and experts, they talk about, about things like crowding and, and territoriality and, and situational behavior. And that situation, when you walk into that movie theater, that space and that situation, that environment is actually affecting how you react and how you respond. Um, there's a, uh, a theory a around something called proxemic zones, and, and it's related to this. Um, and there's four different zones, and there's actually a dimension related to these zones. The intimate is really touching me to 18 inches, so it's very close, it's very intimate. You know, my senses are really heightened when I'm in a situation like that with somebody else. Um, situations like, you know, if you're hugging a friend, that would be in, that would be in the intimate pro proximal zone. Um, or a, or a, a mother holding a baby, okay? Personal, now we move out, you know, 18 inches to, to four feet. And, uh, you know, not quite as intense. Um, situations might include things like, you know, working with somebody at work or, or two students working together on a project. Um, the social zone, now you move from, say, four feet out to uh, 12 feet, um, you know, again, it's, it's starting to, to lessen. The territoriality is lessening. Now we're, uh, we're probably, uh, say, in a party or something. And then you get into the public zone, and if I back up a little bit, you know, that's like 12 feet and beyond. Now it's, you know, it's really not uh, nearly as intense, uh, those reactions. Um, here's a picture of a, of a hotel lobby in, in another situation where, you know, you walk into a hotel lobby and, and sometimes, you know, you can't find the, uh, the reception desk. And this one's, you know, pretty well designed, it's pretty cool, it's very modern. You know, you have a reaction to this kind of environment. Now, it's very different from this hotel lobby, you know. It, it maybe brings up uh, different thoughts or different feelings or a different reaction. And then if we look at this, this beautiful, you know, this very impactful library. You walk into this and you must think, my goodness, you know, there's a history behind learning and, you know, I, I'm, I'm just going to really enjoy being in this space. And you're probably not thinking, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to yell and scream in this space. It's just a wonderful space to just really let it out because it, the space is affecting you. You know, you're thinking about maybe I should be quiet and I should read and I shouldn't make a, make a ruckus. In 2003, the San Diego chapter of the American Institute of Architects uh, partnered with uh, neuroscientists at, at the Salk Institute, and they created the Academy of Neuroscience for Architecture. And the whole point of this is to really understand how to marry the science of, of the mind and what we know about the mind and, and how we think and why we think things and how we react to things with the built environment. And how do you... How do you uh, create better environments, the built environment, that is really aligned with who we are as people and how we think and how we react to those. And maybe if we do that, we can actually design spaces that are more aligned with who we are and how we think and how we operate, like, you know, maybe better, uh, better classroom facilities or better uh, operating rooms or better, uh, better residences. So, so there's a lot behind this idea that space impacts behavior. Uh, I spend every day uh, looking and working in the education environment, and so we're trying to understand how do you make uh, education environments that, that actually work better. Uh, but the way we do that, we're a very human-centered design, kind of design thinking-driven company. And so the first thing we do is we go out and we, we kind of look, what's, look at what's going on. And, and so when we, when we talk to educators and educational leaders, um, 
it's very clear that education is under a lot of pressure to change. Improve graduation rates, in, in, increase student success, get students to be prepared for the jobs, as they say, that don't, e don't even exist yet, with maybe some of the softer skills, you know, the, the 21st century skills. And certainly there's a, a, there's a lot of pressure on cost and, and, and maintaining access. And a lot of this is driven by, you know, I was just in Israel recently, and I'm talking to uh, education leaders, and they're really thinking about how do we make sure that we remain competitive globally. If you talk to students, you look at students, I mean, they're different than they were when I went to school. Uh, students coming into colleges today, they've never not had computers, they've never not had the internet. They have different expectations of the education environment and what goes on in, say, classrooms. Um, you know, we all learn differently. You know, they're asking, am I going to learn in the way that I need to learn best in your institution? Is it relevant to me? Um, and oh, by the way, it's getting really expensive. Is it going to be worth it? And so all of those pressures are driving new behaviors in education. Um, education, especially in higher ed, has typically been a more maybe teacher-centered or teaching-centered situation versus a learning-centered, and that's shifting. New pedagogies, new strategies and, and, and methods of teaching are coming on board as we learn more about how the brain works and how people learn. Things like project-based learning and peer-to-peer and -peer learning, and, and certainly technology is driving online learning. Um, and the combination of online and face-to-face, -face, blended learning is a major trend. Um, and then there's combinations of those, multimodal learning, um, where teachers might use uh, many of these uh, strategies. So we have this, this situation where we know that space impacts behavior, and we have the situation where behaviors are needing to change in the education world to improve student success. So we go out there in our sort of ethnographic mode, and we look at space and we say, so, so are the spaces aligning with all of these changes and all these pressures? And this is what we see. And the pictures I'm going to show you here, we took, our research took in the last five years. So that's a, that's a four-year public college in the U.S. I think this was a community college. Another college out, out actually in Silicon Valley. This is actually a $45,000 a year private university in Silicon Valley. So you're starting to see a little pattern here. Um, these are not real exciting, engaging environments. This, is a, this was taken about three years ago by one of our researchers in the southeast. That's a current classroom. Um, and another one, this is actually my favorite. So we've not only got maybe 60-year-old uh, classrooms, it looks like the furniture's been there since the beginning. So these are all current classrooms with old you know, buildings and old furniture. So now I will show you new classrooms with new furniture, okay? So that's the first one. This is a brand new classroom with new furniture. Oh, they do have some new technology. There's an interactive whiteboard on the wall. And this one has a, a flat, you know, a, a projector on the ceiling. Um, but the paradigm's the same, the model's the same. Wait a minute, space affects behavior. Behaviors need to change to improve learning. You know, something's missing here. So, so uh, uh, Dr. Lenny Scott Weber, who's our Director of Education and Environments, has a PhD in Environment Behavior Theory, and she's a long-practicing interior designer, and she wrote a book um, called InSync, uh, Environmental Behavior Research and the Design of Learning Spaces. And what she says is, you know, we're all conditioned, we're behaviorally conditioned as from an early age. We walk into, a, say, a classroom with rows of tables and chairs, and we know how to behave in that room. What do we do? We sit and we listen. And the teacher knows what to do when they walk into that classroom, typically. And there are certainly exceptions but they stand and deliver. So she said, if we want to change the behavior of the, of the teachers and the students uh, and really improve things, then we have to give them permission to act differently. But we're kind of constraining them be, uh, by the fact that we haven't changed the space. So, so that's, that's the mission we're on. So we're trying to focus on leveraging design thinking to work on that problem. And what is design thinking? Well, it's, it's, it's the idea that we can transform existing conditions into preferred ones if we do the right things. And the key thing in design thinking, and David Kelly at IDEO talks about this all the time, empathy. We first have to build empathy for users, the, you know, the faculty, the students, whoever, whatever we're designing, we have to really get you know, under the skin of the people that are actually in the situation 
doing the functions that they're doing and understand, put ourselves in their shoes. Um, then we need to kind of define the opportunity, then we need to ideate, prototype, rapid prototype, iterate, test, you know, more empathy building, and maybe we'll come out with a good solution. So, so when we go into classrooms all around North America and the world, we see things like this. Uh, we see, you know, backpacks on the floor and books on the floor. Why? Because there's no place to put them. Um, and oh, by the way, I hope we don't trip and, and, and fall. We see students in, in alternative postures uh, because they want to, you know, kind of get comfortable, you know, remain comfortable and, and stay engaged. Um, we see, you know, in this case, the furniture not supporting what's happening, the, the things that the student brought to class. She's got a cell phone in her lap, she's got a calculator, she's, she's holding a paper and writing in the right hand, the picture on the left, you know, the analog and the digital are all stacked on a, on a tablet arm that's too small. This one is actually one of my favorite pictures. This is where the pedagogy isn't lining up with the space. So in this case, the teacher was teaching, he was lecturing for 15 minutes. He then asked the students to get into groups and work in teams. And then he was walking around assessing the, the kids, and then he realized there was something he needed to explain, so he started, he went back to lecture again. So the girl in the right, on the, on the bottom there, was, she kind of turned around because, uh, in, her, in her seat, you know, she can't take notes because her, her, her space is back here, her backpack's on the floor, and it's just so, we look at pictures like this, we say there's an opportunity, you know, the, the, in this case, the furniture's not supporting the pedagogy. Uh, one teacher uh, uh, at one college, told, she took us over, she showed us this, and she said, I don't, wanna, I don't ever want to have another one of these. She said, in this, you're stuck. It's not active, it's not dynamic. The kids can't move, they can't interact. Um, it's, just, it's just not a good situation. So we took all of that and we said, you know, there's really an opportunity to reinvent the simple old, you know, traditional classroom chair to support these new students, these new pedagogies, and these new behaviors. So we started to ideate and, you know, the typical process, you know, generating lots of ideas, really trying to think about scale, trying to think about juxtaposition of work surfaces and seats and, and uh, you know, um, how, how the um, storage might happen. Um, in this picture, you know, we start to get a little more refined and, and we, you know, backpacks are bigs. It's not book racks anymore, it's backpacks. So we want to have a place for backpacks. Um, we want the chairs to be comfortable, so we look at all of these different ideas. Then we start to prototype. Um, how does the base connect to the seat uh, and still leave room for a big backpack? Um, little, you know, scale models. How much room do we need for backpacks? Uh, we just use existing uh, chairs. How do we get at the, the backpacks in the storage to, to access what's in the bag? Um, you saw the work surfaces before. How big does it need to be? I mean, now it's analog and digital. Um, how comfortable do we need to make it? Uh, how do we make sure that the seat fits a, a wide range of users? Um, scale, I mean, you know, enrollment's growing, you know, we can't just make a huge chair, um, so we, you know, kind of compare it, and then, you know, how does it work in context? Um, so these are all rough and dirty prototypes that we built. Uh, then we test, so we go back, and we actually have users sit in them, so again, more empathy. Um, the unintended consequences. The backpack storage is used as a footrest, so we didn't, we didn't know that that would happen. Okay, maybe that's an opportunity. Maybe it's a footrest for shorter students. Um, okay, how do I get into the backpack? Is, is that easy? Where do I hang it? And then, you know, how big is the work surface? How does it move? How do I get in and out of the chair? So all of these are, you know, these prototypes we learn very quickly. So, I'm just going to show you one solution to these, you know, learnings and these observations we had. It's not the only solution. I'm not proposing that, but it's been a really good solution. Um, so this is called Node. Um, node as in students or nodes in a network. A network of students, other students, a faculty in the community. So we really said we want to connect them all. We want to be able for them to connect. Um, and we want to be able to break down those barriers between these different modes in the classroom. Whether it's you know lower left uh, lecture mode or upper left uh, team project mode or upper right um, uh, discussion mode. So if we can break down the barrier to switching between all these different modes, maybe uh, that would be better. Room for the backpack, as I said. Everybody's got a water bottle or a cup of coffee. Um, hey, new technology is coming out like, like tablet computers. How can we get it off the work surface? We only have so much space and make it uh, uh, work for, for more things. 
And then as we start to see these in application, you know, uh, teachers and schools putting them in really creative ways, and now the teacher can say, hey, the blue team over there, the orange team over there, the yellow team over there. Um, just more inspiring and, you know, matching it to the space, trying to inspire students and engage them. A business school in the, in the Midwest and the, and the dean who's super uh, progressive said, we should teach business students like we teach doctors. It should be more authentic. It should be very collaborative. It should be hands-on. Completely redid a, his business school. So then we said, well, okay, all sounds good. Does it work? And people ask me that all the time. Does it work? We need proof. I think that was the topic for this afternoon. So we went out and we said, okay, let's, let's see. So we went in, we asked the question, can the intentional design of space and furniture support increase student engagement? Why? Why did we ask that question? Because we know that increased engagement increases the, the likelihood that students will be successful. So then we looked at lots, you know, what would we measure? What, what does engagement mean? And we went to NESI, National Survey of Student Engagement, and they talk about collaboration. Is there an emphasis on collaboration? Does the space support flexibility of learning methods and teaching methods? Does the space allow the teacher to get to the student for real-time assessment and feedback? Things like this. Movement. Does it, does it enrich the environment so that students belong and they can build a sense of community? So, so we built a survey based on those metrics and we asked the students, okay, reflect back on your old traditional classrooms that you've been in, the one on the left, now compare that to the new classrooms that we developed and how do they work on those 12 engagement factors. And uh, we were truly blown away by the results. Um, so on the left you see the students' responses, on the right you see the faculty responses reflecting on their uh, perception of the students. And so the first question was, are the activities, the 12 factors, actually being employed? and that's on the left side of the, the, the graph, and on the, the right side, the solutions, did the solutions, the space design, the whole ecosystem, actually support those behaviors? And so it was 50 to 100 um, percent improvement. Uh, we also asked the students, you know, what about the ability to be creative in these environments? Uh, increase in motivation to attend class, um, ability to achieve a higher grade projected, and um, engagement in class. Uh, uh, huge numbers. So, kind of, for us, we know space impacts behavior, and new behaviors are needed to support better learning. How might you, if you're a superintendent, a, a student, a teacher, how might you leverage your learning spaces as a strategic tool to improve student success? Thank you. <laughs>